Well, good evening, everyone. How are you doing tonight? You guys look fantastic tonight. We're so glad that you've joined us this evening for our Good Friday service. Um, if you've not picked up a communion cup on your way in and you would like one, would you raise your hand and we'll have our ushers uh, bring one to you. Just keep your hand up and they'll be happy to deliver that to your seat. Um, of course, one of our pastors needs one, so that's good. <laughs> Off to a great start. <laughs> want to remind you uh, this evening at the outset uh, to be sure to come back Sunday for our Easter celebration. Uh, both services are the exact same service at 9.30 and 11 o'clock Sunday morning right here at First Alliance Church. You know, the purpose of this evening is to spend time in remembrance and reflection. It's a time to reflect on the sacrifice that Christ made for us in going to the cross. It's often a, a solemn time because in remembering the sacrifice, it calls us to remember our sin. It calls us to remember our own brokenness and our own disconnection from God. And that's often the part that, that we as people neglect. It's often the part that we pass over very quickly. That sin took Christ to the cross. We want to blame it on other people. We want to blame it on the crowds. We want to blame it on religious people. We want to blame it on rulers of the time, but it was sin. It was brokenness, mine and, and yours. It's often a solemn time because we recall also the, the brutality of death and the brokenness of relationships. Think of how Christ walked with friends for, 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 for years and on that night and in those hours, they betrayed him and left him, disowned him, cursed his name. Broken friendships, broken relationships, the emptiness of loss. Tonight is a night to feel. And I would encourage you as, as much as you can with, with the scriptures that, we've, that we bring, with the songs that we sing, with the moments that we have to feel the weight of, of what Christ bore for us, to feel what it meant to go to the cross. Tonight is a night to feel that weight and to remember what Christ has done. And so we do, we do this by starting with communion. Uh, in the gospel accounts, that night started with the Passover meal. It started in the upper room. It started with the Lord's Supper. And it's the celebration of that Passover meal in which the Jews observed and remembered how God saved them and how God delivered them. Jesus very pointedly uh, that night takes the opportunity to insert himself into the middle of that meal. Uh, even as his countenance is turned towards the cross that was set before him. As we share this meal together to start our evening, just as they did in the upper room, let's remember the words of Christ and in song offer our thanks for what he has done for us, even as he thanked the Father. Would you pray with me? Lord Jesus, on this night, we have come to reflect upon what you have done for us, to remember your sacrifice. And God, I pray that uh, as we as we do so this evening, it would be an act of worship to you. 
It would be our heart crying, thank you. It would be our spirit understanding, maybe just a little or maybe just for a moment, the weight of sin, the seriousness of our spirits. And how you wrestled and how you surrendered and how you loved us. And so tonight, Father, I pray that we would not rush through this evening to get to the other side, but we would sit with the words, we would sit with the scriptures, we would sit with the prayers, and we would remember not just what we've done, but we would remember who you are for us. And that that would be made fresh and new again in our hearts and lives, even tonight. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. From the Gospel of Luke, chapter 22, it says this. When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table. And he said to them, I I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds its fulfillment in the kingdom of God. After taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, take this and, and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. As we prepare our hearts to share the Lord's Supper together, let's take a moment to examine ourselves. Let's do so in this call and response reading. I will read the pastor's line and you should respond with the congregation's line. Will you stand with me? Let us remember Jesus, who though rich became poor and dwelt among us, who was mighty indeed, healing the sick and the troubled, who as a teacher to his disciples was their companion and servant. Let us remember Jesus, who prayed for the forgiveness of those who rejected him and for the perfecting of those who received him who loved all people and prayed for them even if they denied and rejected him, who hated sin because he knew the cost of pride and selfishness, of cruelty and hatred, both to people and to God. Let us remember Jesus, who humbled himself, obedient unto the cross, God has exalted him who has redeemed us from the bondage of sin and given us new freedom. Will you remain standing as we sing?
And now will you join me in this prayer of confession? Let us read it together in unison. God of mercy, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. God of heaven, would you receive these words from our heart and from our lips? Would you prepare our spirit to receive these elements given for us in sacrifice, given for us in love? It's in the name of Christ we pray. Amen. From Luke's Gospel, chapter 22. He took the bread, gave thanks, and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us take the bread together. Verse 20. In the same way, After the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed. But woe to the man that who betrays him. They began to question among themselves which of them it might be who would do this. Let us drink the cup together. Thirty-nine. Jesus went out as usual to the Mount of Olives, and his disciples followed him. On reaching the place, he said to them, "Pray that you will not fall into temptation." He withdrew, he withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down, and prayed, "Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours, be done." An angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him. And being in anguish, he prayed more earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. When he rose from prayer and went back to the disciples, he found them asleep, exhausted from sorrow. Why are you sleeping, he asked them. Get up and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. While he was still speaking, a crowd came up, and the man who was called Judas, one of the twelve, was leading them. He approached Jesus with a kiss. But Jesus asked him, Judas, are you betraying me, the son of man, with a kiss? When Jesus' followers saw what was going to happen, they said, Lord, should we strike with our swords? And one of them struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his right ear. But Jesus answered, no more of this. And he touched the man's ear and healed him. Then Jesus said to the chief priests, the officers of the temple guard, and the elders who had come for him, am I leading a rebellion that you have come with swords and clubs? Every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not lay a hand on me. But this hour is your hour when darkness reigns. Would you stand as we continue to sing?
and mocked and scorned Bowing to the Father's will He took a crown of thorns And all that rugged cross My salvation Where your love poured out over me and now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor to thee scent of heaven god's own son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree and all oh, that rugged cross my salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee my debt is paid it is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. You can be seated. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we come to you tonight as people who have no right or claim to come before you other than the work of Jesus on the cross. We remember the pain that you went through, physical pain. We think of the loneliness of being left by all of your disciples. We think of the betrayal from one of your closest friends. 
And Jesus, we think of that moment when the Heavenly Father turned his back on you, the worst of all. And that was because of us. Even though none of us were alive at that moment, it was known even then the lives that we would lead, the things that we would say, the things that we wouldn't say that should have been said, the thoughts that were said when we thought nobody knew were laid bare before heaven. And for the actions, whether self-serving or filled with sin or just not even thinking of you. Father, we lay all of these before you because we know that they are full in your sight. God, we thank you that all of this was done to fulfill prophecy, to fulfill the plan that you had in place before the beginning of time, before there was even a creation, this plan was in place. Father, we thank you for the relationship that this affords us to have with you and only because of Jesus. Help us to remember these things and not to take for granted what you have done. Forgive us for our actions and our thoughts, our attitudes, and just for our callousness. Father, we thank you that by your wounds we have been healed. We thank you that you took on our sin, bore the penalty on our behalf so that we could be in a relationship with the Holy Trinity. And Father, we pray that you would never let us forget all that we have been afforded and that you would give us a great desire to not keep this great message to ourselves, but to go out to all parts of our neighborhoods and our city to pray and support those who have been sent to the world so that there would be many more that would come to know you from every tribe and nation and people group so that heaven is filled one day and for all eternity with worshipers of God. That is our great desire. And Father, we thank you for this evening that reminds us of why that is possible. In Jesus' name, amen. Day, Christ on the road to Calvary, tried by sinful men, torn and beaten, then nailed to a cross of wood. This the power.
Now the daylight flees Now the ground beneath Quakes as its maker Bows his head Curtain torn in two The dead are raised to life Finish the victory cry Thank you. What a beautiful song. Well, good evening. It's a real joy to be with you tonight uh, as we celebrate this solemn evening, as we remember Jesus' sacrifice for us uh, on the cross. Uh, Just two days ago, Crick and I were out for dinner with some friends, uh, a young Ukrainian refugee couple have only been in the country for uh, a year and we've gotten to know them this year. And during our meal, the wife asks us, why do you call it Good Friday? Like, it's not a good day. Uh, and Crick and I were kind of embarrassed and we looked at each other and we're like, yeah, we probably knew this at some point and don't really remember why it's called Good Friday. Uh, and um, so we went home and Crick decided she's gonna investigate uh, which is pretty easy these days with internet, and um, then decided to investigate, well, let's look at the other countries we've lived in as well, overseas. So, so we already knew Russia is Strasnaya Pyatnitsa, which means passion, passion Friday. 
uh, we weren't sure about Ukrainian, but Ukraine is mourning Friday, like to, to mourn. So M-O-U-R-N. And then Germany, where we lived last year, is also mourning or lamenting Friday. Uh, but most linguists say Good Friday. Maybe everybody already knows this and the fact that I've been out of the country for most of the last 24 years, I'm a little behind uh, on the news. But Good Friday, linguists say, comes from most likely the old English word for holy. Uh, I think probably most of us think, well, it was good because Jesus had to die and then he rose again. That's what some say as well. But apparently most linguists also say uh, or tend to say that it is the old English word for holy. So that's just a little bit of extra information that has nothing to do with my message. Um, but just thought it was an interesting tidbit of information. Well, this past Sunday, you celebrated Palm Sunday. And Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem. And for these past days since then, we as followers of Christ have focused our thoughts and prayers on the events of this week. And especially this weekend that we refer to as the Passion Week. And this evening we recognize the King, Jesus, on the cross. Jesus had entered Jerusalem it was preached about just this past Sunday. He had entered Jerusalem on Palm Sunday just five days before as a hero. The people wanting to crown him their king. Today, Good Friday, he would actually become their sacrificial Passover lamb. The lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. As John the Baptist prophesied about him three years earlier. Much has been said over the last two millennia about the crucifixion of Christ. The Old Testament is filled with prophecies about the Messiah's death. The four Gospels carefully detail the events of the week. And the remaining books of the New Testament point back to it as the turning point in our battle against sin and death. Let me read for you several quotes from modern Christian leaders about the crucifixion and death of Christ. C.S. Lewis says, It costs God nothing, so far as we know, to create nice things, but to convert rebellious wills cost him crucifixion. Oswald Chambers says, All of heaven is interested in the cross of Christ. Hell afraid of it, while men are the only ones to ignore its meaning. J.C. Ryle wrote, take away the cross of Christ, and the Bible is a dark book. And Jared Wilson said, beautiful ironies of the cross. As they mock him, they submit to prophecy. As they lift him, they exalt him. As they kill him, he conquers. Before we read tonight's passage, I want us to have in mind something that Jesus said while on his way to Jerusalem before riding into the city on the colt. Several times, at least two that I can think of in Scripture, uh, in those days before he was arrested, he again predicts his arrest, death, and resurrection to his disciples. And what's so significant about this and what I want you to be thinking of uh, throughout this message and throughout the weekend is that he knew what was about to happen. He knew the pain and suffering he would have to endure. And yet he willingly went through with it for you and for me. Many of us here have read this story dozens upon dozens of times over the years. We've heard lots of sermons, Good Friday and Easter, Easter Sunday sermons over the years. And although that's a blessing for us to have that kind of access to the scriptures, the danger is that over the years it's lost the impact, the shocking effect that a crucifixion should have on us. 
So as we read, as I read these verses tonight, as we think about his crucifixion tonight, try to imagine as much as possible that you're reading these words for the first time. If you have your Bibles, please open to Luke 23, verses 26 to 49. Uh, The words will also be on the screen behind me. Luke 23, 26 to 49. It's a long passage, but we want to get the whole story in tonight. Luke 23. Luke writes, as the soldiers led him away, they seized Simon from Cyrene, who was on his way in from the country, and put the cross on him and made him carry it behind Jesus. A large number of people followed him, including women who mourned and wailed for him. Jesus turned and said to them, Daughters of Jerusalem, do not weep for me. Weep for yourselves and for your children. For the time will come when you will say, Blessed are the childless women, the wombs that never bore and the breasts that never nursed. Then they will say to the mountains, Fall on us, and the hills cover us. For if people do these things when the tree is green, what will happen when it is dry? Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with him to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they divided up his clothes by casting lots. The people stood watching, and the rulers even sneered at him. They said, He saved others. Let him save himself if he is God's Messiah. The chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things. What I would like for us to take away from this story tonight is how Jesus, the suffering servant, having been whipped and beaten and now being crucified, continued to serve the people around him during these events. And I want us to take note tonight of his responses to the people surrounding him in this passage. And the first response that we see from him is that he cared for them. In verses 20, we see this in verses 21, 26 to 31. You know, as someone's being led away to their death, their attention tends to be turned towards themselves, I assume, right? And their needs. What will they eat for their last meal? Will a pastor or a priest come in and pray for them? Will they be able to spend time with close loved ones in their last minutes? Some might apologize to the victim's family. Sometimes their attitude is just one of resignation and just getting this over with. But with Jesus, we see something completely different. Jesus was concerned about those who would be left behind. As some of, the, some of the women were weeping for him, he goes on to foretell most likely the events of A.D. 70 
when the Roman army attacked Jerusalem, besieged the city, and destroyed the temple. And I don't want us to focus specifically on Jesus' words in these verses as much as on the fact that while marching to the place called the skull for his crucifixion, having been beaten, whipped, ridiculed, spit upon, and a crown of thorns forced down on his skull, he takes the time to warn them about what's to come. As usual, Jesus wasn't thinking about himself. We see a very similar response by Jesus in John's version of the crucifixion story in John 19. And we don't know how long he had been hanging on the cross. But at some point, while on the cross, he sees his mother and John standing near each other. And he looks at them and he says to them, Dear woman, here is your son. And he says to John, here is your mother. And John writes, from that time on, he took her into his home. That's what Jesus does. He cares for our needs. He reached out and cared for those around him at the most difficult point in his life while he was dying. And he continues to care for our needs today. I'm sure if we asked for testimonies here of how Jesus is caring for you, it would be one after another popping up, sharing testimonies of how he's cared for you, of how he's helped you and, meet, and meets you in your time of need. And he says in Matthew 11, uh, famous words which, which many of us here probably know, Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Jesus, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, cares for you. He cares that you're weary, burdened, and anxious, and he wants to give you rest by taking your cares upon himself. And he showed his love to us in the greatest way he could by hanging on a tree so that we could be reconciled to God the Father. Billy Graham said, God proved his love on the cross. When Christ hung and bled and died, it was God saying to the world, I love you. The Apostle Paul wrote it this way in Romans 5. He said, you see, at just the right time when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous person, though for, for a good person someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Well, the second response that we see from Jesus in this passage is that he forgave them. And we see that in verses 32 to 34. Because of his great mercy and love, while hanging on a cross, Jesus was able to forgive those who crucified him. Richard Foster wrote, Love, not anger, brought Jesus to the cross. Golgotha came as a result of God's great desire to forgive, not his reluctance. If God had been reluctant, he would have never sent his son to this earth with the plan that he would give his life for us. If he was reluctant, he would have jumped at the chance to save him after Jesus' prayer in the garden that night before when he was arrested. You remember what, what he prayed that night. Actually, Pastor Chen already, already read that. So this is the night before his crucifixion when he was in the garden and he prayed to his father, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but yours be done. And then we read, as Pastor Chen already read, that an angel from heaven appeared to him and strengthened him and that his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. I don't think it's sacrilegious or incorrect to say that Jesus was terrified. Remember, 
He wasn't only fully God. He was also fully man. As I've already said, he knew the pain that he was about to endure. I'm sure he had seen crucifixions at some point in his life. Not only the nails that were going to be in his hands and feet while hanging on the cross, but he knew the beating and the whipping that, he would, that would be done to him before he ever even got there. If God was reluctant, he would have saved his son from that. We have a lot of parents here. No parent ever wants to see their child suffer. Do you, also, do you remember what also happened that night in the garden after Jesus had prayed that prayer? And then, as Pastor Chen read as well, uh, Judas showed up to betray Jesus. Peter took out the sword, cut off the ear of the servant of the high priest in an attempt to defend Jesus. Do you remember what Jesus said in response? He said, do you think I cannot call on my father and he will at once put at my disposal more than 12 legions of angels? But how then would the scriptures be fulfilled to say that it must happen in, G in this way? Jesus had the authority to call the angels of heaven to save him from what he was about to go through. If either he or his father were reluctant, angels would have swooped in and saved him. But he continued on because of his great love for us. He was not reluctant to go to the cross or to forgive those who crucified him. Well, the third response we see from Jesus towards the people around him is that he welcomed them. We see this in verses 35 to 43. And I'm speaking here specifically about the thief on the cross. But first I want us to draw I want to draw our attention to the written notice above Jesus on the cross which which reads this is the king of the Jews. And all four of the gospels mention this sign. This wasn't a this wasn't a statement by Pilate announcing that he believed Jesus is who he claims to be. Instead, it was done as a way to mock him and to mock Jewish leaders for trumping up these charges against him. So just as the soldiers had put that robe on him and a crown on his head, it was all done to mock him for claiming to be the son of God. But despite all of this, he continued to care, forgive, and now welcome as he says to the repentant thief, today you will be with me in paradise. When we turn towards God, recognizing our sin and guilt and that we are unable to save ourselves, Jesus is always there to welcome us. And that's exactly what he did with this thief. While the other thief was hurling insults at him, the other, while the one thief was hurling insults at him, the other recognized Jesus for who he really is, the Savior of the world, the one who forgives our sins and determines where each of us is going to spend eternity. Jesus says in John chapter 6 that it's God's spirit that draws a man to himself. A person can't conjure up those feelings on their own. So this interaction on the crosses between Christ and the thief is, is interesting and is a beautiful picture of the work of God in a person's life. We don't know anything else about this man. We don't know, was he a, a lifelong a lifelong criminal? Or was this a one-time event and he just happened to be caught? But at some point, whether it was on the cross or beforehand, God's spirit draws him to himself. The thief understands and believes on Jesus. And Jesus welcomes him into paradise that day. What a beautiful picture of how salvation works and how God accepts people into his kingdom no matter how sinful they have been. And he even does it in their last moments of life if they turn to him and acknowledge him. C.J. Mahaney said, Unless you see yourself standing there with a the shrieking crowd 
full of hostility and hatred for the holy and innocent Lamb of God. You don't really understand the nature and depth of your sin or the necessity of the cross. It seems that the thief understood this and he entered paradise that day. Jesus' final response on the cross wasn't a response to the people around him. In verses 44 to 49, we see that his response is that he committed himself back to his father. As Jesus is about to die, it's interesting that we we read several different uh, natural events that begin to take place. Darkness came over the whole land. The sun stopped shining. Matthew, in his account, writes that the earth shook and the rocks split. The tombs broke open and the bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. And then we read in verse 45 that the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And what's so significant about this? Why it was noted is that the curtain being torn in two symbolizes the veil between God and man being torn away by Jesus. Because of his death, we're no longer separated from God. We now have direct access to God the Father through Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. And then Jesus commits himself back to his Father. Back into the hands of his father, and he dies. In John's account of of the crucifixion, he writes that when Jesus was dying, he says, it is finished. You may have heard at some time what Chuck Swindoll says about this. He said, Jesus tilted his head back, pulled up one last time to draw breath, and cried, to Tetelestai. It was a Greek expression most everyone present would have understood. It was an accounting term. Archaeologists have found papyrus tax receipts with the telestai written across them, meaning paid in full. With Jesus' last breath on the cross, he declared the dead of sin canceled, completely satisfied. Nothing else required, not good deeds, not generous donations, not penance or confession or baptism or, or, or nothing. The penalty for sin is death, and we were all born hopelessly in debt. He paid our debt in full by giving his life so that we might live forever. When Jesus died... Having seen all these things take place, the centurion standing before him praised God and said, surely this was a righteous man. Can you say the same thing? Can you say with confidence in your heart that he is a righteous man, savior of the world, the son of God? the author of life, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world? Have you turned to him in confession as the thief did on the cross that day? Because I can assure you, if you do, that he'll forgive and welcome you just as he did on that day. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that despite your great love for your Son, you were not reluctant. You were not willing to withhold him from coming to this earth, to to live as a man, and to undergo the harsh treatment and crucifixion that we remember this weekend. And you weren't reluctant and you were willing to send him because of your great love for us. And he was willing to go. He went. 
for us. We thank you. We love you. We thank you that th for the example that, that he gave even while suffering on the cross, that he forgave. I'm sure there's a lot of some of us in here that need to forgive. He welcomed. He cared for. And you continue to do the same for us today. May we do the same for people around us. I pray, Father, that this story that we've heard many of us so many times, that it will impact us in a new way this weekend. One in ways we haven't thought of. The only way that it can impact us is because your spirit is at work in us to make things new. And so may you make this new and transform our lives because of it, we ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Would you stand and sing one more song with us? Jesus, glory to God in heaven, your blood.